In the charming streets of Macon, Georgia, the life of a promising young law student took a dark turn, unveiling a mystery that would grip the community. This is the story of Lauren Teresa Giddings, a narrative that began with dreams of a successful legal career, but ended in a chilling tale of crime, deception, and tragedy. Lauren, a bright and ambitious law student, was on the verge of realizing her aspirations. However, the tranquil facade of her neighborhood held secrets that would unfold in a way that no one could have anticipated. Lauren Teresa Giddings was born on April 18, 1984, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, to William Bill and Karen Payne Giddings. Growing up in Laurel, a suburban community nestled between Washington and Baltimore, she shared her home with her two younger sisters, Caitlin and Sarah. Actively involved in the community, Lauren was a dedicated member of St. Mary of the Mills Catholic Church and completed her early education at St. Mary's School, attending from kindergarten through eighth grade. After graduating from Atholton High School in Columbia in 2002, Lauren left a mark through her participation in field hockey and softball. In pursuit of higher education, she ventured to Macon, Georgia in the same year, enrolling at Agnes Scott College. At Agnes Scott, she majored in political science, minored in religious studies, and enthusiastically participated in softball. Lauren achieved her graduation in 2006, becoming the first in her family to attend college, a source of immense pride for her parents. Caitlin, Lauren's sister, reflected on her transformation, saying, She really didn't bloom until college. She was loud and fun. She wasn't as much like that in high school. It became evident that Lauren's confidence developed with age, and she was evolving into a brilliant, mature woman poised for a successful career. Following her undergraduate studies, she returned home, initially working for the National Center for Public Policy in Washington, D.C. Subsequently, she decided to venture into law. In 2008, Lauren embarked on her legal education at Mercer University's Walter F. George School of Law, where she took on the role of president of the Federalist Society. On May 14, 2011, she achieved her Juris Doctorate degree. Lauren aspired to be a public defender, driven by the desire to assist others. With her signature blonde hair and penchant for wearing pink, Lauren adored animals, particularly her cherished Pekingese dog named Butterbean, who was always by her side. Renowned for her popularity and kindness, friends and family recalled how Lauren consistently went out of her way to befriend social outcasts, possessing the unique ability to see the good in everyone. Perhaps it was this virtue that unfortunately made her the target of an incredibly heinous crime. In June 2011, Lauren found herself eagerly anticipating the future. At 27 years old, she reached a significant milestone by graduating from Mercer University in Georgia after seven arduous years dedicated to the study of law. The journey had been marked by prolonged stress and intense exhaustion, but Lauren's unwavering determination to become a criminal lawyer fueled her commitment to see it through. With the finish line nearly in sight, there remained one last hurdle, the bar exam. Like many students, Lauren opted to stay in Macon after graduation instead of returning home to Baltimore. Her chosen residence was conveniently located just across from Mercer University, allowing her to immerse herself completely in her studies, free from any potential interruptions. Having recently graduated from law school, Lauren and her friends decided to indulge in one last night of celebration before diving into their bar exam preparations. On the Friday night of June 24, 2011, they gathered at a local bar for a joyous evening. Lauren opted to spend the night at her friend Ashley's house, joining other members of their friend group. During the night, Lauren shared with her friends her unsettling suspicion that she had a stalker. She recounted instances of returning home to find things in her apartment rearranged, a concern she had previously mentioned a year earlier to her sister. On a separate occasion, a friend had informed her of seeing someone spying on her through her window, equipped with a large stick topped with a camera aimed at her second-floor apartment. In an email sent to her boyfriend David Vandever on the night before her tragic demise, Lauren expressed her fear that someone was breaking into her apartment. However, she reassured him that she would be moving out that week and was determined to endure the situation until then. In the same email, she conveyed her feelings of hopefulness and excitement about the future. During the night of celebration, Joe, Lauren's ex-boyfriend and a roommate of Ashley's, was in attendance. 
Lauren ultimately spent the night in Joe's room, but the details of what occurred behind the closed door remain unknown. The following morning after the festivities, Lauren left Ashley's house. Although her friends didn't witness her departure, Joe claimed to have seen her leave. Regrettably, that marked the final instance her friends saw or heard from her. In the days following the celebration, a disconcerting silence surrounded Lauren as no one heard from her. Given her close ties with her family and regular communication, they initially attributed her absence to her prior warning that she would be immersed in studying for the bar exam and likely unavailable for the next few weeks. Lauren had even taken the step of leaving her beloved dog Butterbean at her parents' house to eliminate distractions and wholly concentrate on exam preparations. Consequently, her family wasn't overly alarmed when days passed without any communication from Lauren. However, as several days lapsed with continued silence, Lauren's sister grew increasingly concerned. Recalling the last text exchange on the night of the celebrations, her sister realized days later that Lauren had never responded, intensifying the sense of unease and prompting them to delve deeper into the mystery surrounding her sudden disappearance. On June 30th, 2011, Lauren's friend Ashley, growing increasingly worried as she hadn't received any responses to her texts over the past few days, took the initiative to check on Lauren. She went to Lauren's apartment and knocked on the door, but received no answer. Concern deepened when calls to Lauren's mobile phone went unanswered, a departure from her usual studious and focused routine at Ashley's house. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Ashley contacted Lauren's sister, Caitlin, to inquire if Lauren might be at her parents' house. To everyone's surprise and alarm, Lauren had never made it to her parents' home. Armed with a spare key to Lauren's apartment, Ashley, accompanied by a few friends, entered the residence. At this point, four days had passed without any communication from Lauren. Compounding the concern was the fact that Lauren was scheduled to move to her boyfriend David's place an hour away the next day. Upon entering the apartment, they discovered signs that Lauren had started packing but hadn't completed the task. Her phone, keys, and other personal belongings were left behind, and her car remained parked outside. Ashley and her friends waited for Lauren's return, but to their dismay, she did not reappear. The mysterious circumstances surrounding her absence deepened the sense of unease and raised more questions than answers. Upon discovering Lauren's unsettling disappearance, Ashley promptly contacted Lauren's family to convey the distressing news. Lauren's father, fueled by concern, embarked on an 11-hour drive to his daughter's apartment in a desperate attempt to locate her. Simultaneously, the police were notified and Lauren's case transitioned into a missing person investigation. Given the circumstances, David, her boyfriend, and Joe, her ex-boyfriend, drew immediate scrutiny as potential suspects, particularly since Joe was the last person known to have seen her. Despite Joe's cooperative stance and assertion that Lauren left early for a pool visit, suspicions lingered. The police delved into Lauren's credit card statements, uncovering an entry fee for a pool at a country club that morning, as well as a receipt from a fast food restaurant later that Saturday night. The investigation took a distressing turn when police examined Lauren's computer and discovered an email she had sent to David. In the email, she expressed her anxiety, believing that someone had attempted to break into her apartment the night before while she was away, an ominous revelation that heightened concerns about her well-being. Upon entering Lauren's apartment, the police encountered an absence of signs indicating a struggle or forced entry, and no items were reported stolen or missing. Despite these initial observations, a sense of foreboding prompted the police to escalate their investigation. Seeking potential evidence, a crime lab tech team was brought in to utilize luminol within the apartment, hoping to detect traces of blood. The critical breakthrough occurred in Lauren's bathroom, where the luminol reacted vividly. The substance illuminated the space like a Christmas tree, revealing blood splatters covering the bathtub, smeared across the floor, and sprayed up the walls. This distressing revelation left the police with a chilling realization. Their search was no longer for a missing person, but for a potential crime scene involving a body. While at the location, detectives were struck by an unpleasant odor, prompting one of them to remark, While we were standing there, the wind started to turn. Immediately, I smelled an odour that I was familiar with. We all smell things in life that smell bad. And that of a body, or a decomposing body, is one of the worst things you'll smell. But it has a very distinctive smell. 
Following the unmistakable smell of death, the detectives traced it to a sizable barrel containing two trash bags. The first bag contained only refuse, offering no breakthrough. However, the second bag held a gruesome discovery, the torso of a white female. The body, wrapped in plastic, had been dismembered, with the head, legs and arms missing. Faced with this horrifying scene, the police opted not to immediately inform the family as they hadn't conclusively identified the remains as belonging to Lauren Giddings. Unfortunately, news of the torso's discovery leaked to a media outlet, sparking widespread awareness. Subsequent DNA analysis later confirmed the tragic truth. The body indeed belonged to the law student, Lauren Giddings. The brutal murder of a cherished member of the Mercer Law School community was shocking in itself. However, as friends began to share their accounts, a disconcerting pattern emerged. Recollections surfaced, revealing that Lauren had, with a sense of unease, hinted at being stalked over the past year. In conversations with friends, she confided in the unsettling belief that someone was covertly observing her in her apartment, going so far as to rearrange things when she was away. These revelations added an alarming layer to the tragedy, underscoring the distress Lauren had experienced leading up to the heinous crime. As news spread that most of Lauren's body had been discovered, a wave of panic swept through the community, amplifying concerns that a potential killer was in the vicinity. Reporters descended upon the apartment complex, seeking interviews and adding to the growing unease. Responding to the escalating situation, the police expanded their initial search from the immediate neighborhood to a radius of 10 blocks around the apartments, hoping to uncover crucial clues to solve the homicide. Over the following week, the search extended to various locations, including in and around the apartments, along the Okmulgee River, at McCon's landfill, and in drains and sewers near the crime scene, all in a desperate attempt to locate the missing body parts. With 16 apartments in the block where Lauren resided, news stations swarmed the crime scene, eager to gather information. Among those interviewed was Stephen McDaniel, Lauren's next-door neighbour and fellow law student. Though perceived as somewhat eccentric, Stephen appeared genuinely concerned for his neighbour and classmate during the interviews. During a field interview, a reporter questioned Stephen about his reaction to the discovery of a body in the area, and his response was nothing short of peculiar. Upon hearing the word body, Stephen entered a disoriented state, repeating the word while blinking and staring off into space. Concerned by his unusual reaction, the police decided to bring him in for questioning. Throughout the interrogation, Stephen remained dissociated for a considerable period. When the police requested to inspect his apartment, Stephen consented. During the search, they uncovered a stack of condoms in his dresser, a discovery that contradicted his previous claim to investigators that he was a virgin saving himself for marriage. In response, Stephen asserted that he had stolen the condoms from various apartments he had burglarized. Consequently, the police detained him on burglary charges. Further investigations revealed that Stephen possessed a master key to all the apartments in the complex, including one for Lauren's residence. In a startling turn, the police discovered a hacksaw in the maintenance room with traces of Lauren's blood on it. The maintenance man, when interrogated, claimed no knowledge of the saw. Subsequently, the police found the hacksaw's packaging in Stephen's apartment, leading them to suspect that, with his master key, he had planted the hacksaw in the maintenance room. In addition to the alarming discoveries, the police stumbled upon a pair of panties belonging to Lauren during their search of Stephen's apartment. Further intensifying the evidence against him, they uncovered numerous disturbing internet blog posts written by Stephen, detailing themes of torture and violence towards women. To compound matters, a flash drive was found containing explicit child pornography. The investigation revealed that Stephen possessed a trove of Lauren's photos on the flash drive, coupled with evidence suggesting he frequently visited her social media pages. His search history depicted a disturbing pattern, wherein he engaged in viewing violent pornography while simultaneously perusing Lauren's pictures on social media. The extent of his obsession became clearer when the police managed to recover deleted footage secretly filmed by Stephen, capturing moments of Lauren's life from an external vantage point. The sheer volume of evidence surpassed 200 pieces, collectively painting a vivid picture that pointed towards Stephen McDaniel as the likely perpetrator of Lauren's murder. It became evident that he had been persistently stalking Lauren for an extended period, amassing numerous images taken without her knowledge, video footage from inside her apartment, and indications of obsessive scrutiny of her Facebook and LinkedIn pages. 
While Lauren had maintained a friendly relationship with Stephen, it became apparent that he harbored an intense obsession with her, even though her feelings towards him were not reciprocated. There was a moment when Stephen gathered the courage to ask Lauren out on a date, only to face a polite refusal from her. Unbeknownst to Lauren, suspicions lingered in her mind about activities occurring in her apartment, unaware that Stephen played a role in the unsettling events unfolding around her. Upon his arrest, Stephen McDaniel was brought in for questioning at the police station. However, upon arrival, he appeared to be a mere semblance of the man who had engaged with the news anchor. Throughout more than two hours of interrogation, he remained in a trance-like state, offering minimal responses and consistently denying any involvement. While some suspected this behavior to be an act, others pondered the possibility of him experiencing a mental breakdown. The fortuitous delay in the garbage collection that morning was the sole reason Lauren's body had not been discarded with the trash. During his interview, Stephen, seemingly unaware of this delay, mistakenly believed that Lauren's body had already been disposed of, alleviating the urgency of the situation in his mind. In August, a mere month after the discovery of Lauren Giddings' remains, Stephen McDaniel faced first-degree murder charges. Despite maintaining his innocence for several months, he eventually altered his plea from not guilty to guilty, recognizing the overwhelming evidence against him. During the trial, Stephen attempted to mount his defense, asserting that his rights were violated during his arrest. Drawing on his legal education, he accused the police of employing improper interrogation techniques and intimidation and claimed to have been denied adequate medical care while asserting that he was insulted and yelled at. As part of the plea deal, Stephen agreed to provide the court with a detailed account of the events on the night of Lauren's murder. In exchange for his cooperation, the charges related to child pornography and burglary were slated to be dropped. In his confession, Stephen detailed that on the fateful night, he waited for Lauren to fall asleep before using his master key to enter her home around 4.30 a.m. Once inside, he silently entered her bedroom and stood observing her as she slept. However, an unfortunate creak from a squeaky floorboard startled Lauren awake when he approached her bed. Stephen recounted, Lauren saw me and said, very calmly, get the f*** out. He continued to describe how, in response to her resistance, he grabbed her around the throat, leading to both of them tumbling from the bed to the floor. During the struggle, Lauren's attempt to escape resulted in her legs and lower body becoming wedged under the bed, thwarting her efforts to get away or kick him. Despite Stephen's attempt to present a version of self-defense, the compelling evidence and his admission to the murder were sufficient for both the jury and the judge to render a verdict. Additionally, Stephen disclosed that he had repeatedly asked Lauren out, and each time she rejected his advances due to being in a happy relationship and lacking any romantic interest in him. Unable to cope with the rejection, he began to hatch a sinister plan for the horrific murder. Amid the assault, Stephen had concealed his identity with a mask, but during the struggle, Lauren managed to remove it, revealing his face. Upon recognizing him, she uttered, Stephen, please stop. Regrettably, her plea went unanswered. Stephen recounted that it took approximately 15 minutes for Lauren to succumb to the attack. After her demise, he dragged her lifeless body into the bathroom, exited her apartment, and returned to his adjoining residence. During the entire day, he occupied himself on the internet before revisiting Lauren's apartment in the evening, armed with a hacksaw. It was then that he proceeded to behead and dismember her. In a chilling disclosure to his lawyer, Stephen admitted to sitting down and meticulously severing each of Lauren's fingers, subsequently flushing them down the toilet. The remaining body parts were placed in black trash bags and dispersed across various dumpsters. Tragically, some of these dumpsters had already been emptied, rendering it impossible to recover Lauren's body. In attempting to discern the motive behind the attack, it became evident that Lauren was scheduled to relocate from her apartment the following day. This impending move meant that Stephen would no longer have her presence in his life, an outcome he seemingly could not bear. On April 21, 2012, Stephen McDaniel was convicted and handed a life sentence, with the potential for parole after 30 years. Despite his attempt to appeal the sentence in 2018, the Richmond County Superior Court dismissed his appeal. He is slated to be ineligible for parole until the year 2041.
Lauren's untimely end left a profound impact on her family and friends. The pain they carry serves as a somber reminder of the heinous crime that shattered the peace of their community. In the aftermath, the community came together to support one another, to remember Lauren's vibrant spirit, and to advocate for safety and awareness in the face of the unexpected. The Lauren Teresa Gidding story is a powerful testament to the resilience of a community in the face of darkness. May her memory inspire conversations about safety, trust, and the collective responsibility we bear for the well-being of those around us. If you found this video compelling, leave a like, and your thoughts in the comments, be sure to subscribe and check out our other videos.